direction to move in this specific direction by two meters. If I say just move two meters and there is no specific direction given to you, then that means I'm talking about scalars because I didn't demand which direction you should move. Second thing is, if I say move two meters towards north, and then in that case, you are bound to move towards north because if you are moving in any other direction, then that will be incorrect. This will be disobeying the command, right? So that will be that will be the, the way in which we are describing or using our language. If I ask you your house is wherever your house is, and if I ask you in which direction is the supermarket from your house, then you you from your house, from your room, you are pointing your hand toward a direction that in this direction is the supermarket. If I go there, it is not necessarily a straight line. I will be going through the, the streets and the streets might be a little bit uh, kinky, right? So there will be a lot of turns in the, in the streets. But you are pointing a hand in a particular direction, which supposedly your mind is perceiving that this is the shortest distance between you and the supermarket. So the thing that the way in which you are describing the direction to the supermarket, that is a vector. OK. In other physical quantities which we are familiar with at this point, displacement, velocity and acceleration. These are three things that we had discussed in last chapter. These are vectors. OK, what are scalars? Well, again, the difference between scalar and vector is the direction. So if I'm talking about a time, I'm saying for how long you have been here in this class today? Probably you're saying five minutes, two minutes, three minutes, right? But all those five minutes, two minutes, three minutes, these are just the, the time you are describing here. You are not saying that five minutes towards east. Right, because that's not something you are saying normally in normal language. Second, the speed is also a scalar quantity. Other thing is temperature. If I say how hot is outside, you might be saying, well, today is 45. That's what my car uh, uh, thermometer is reading to me, 45. You are not saying 45 towards north or south or east or west. So the directions are also lost in that case as well. Similarly, the distance. Like when you are talking about the distance, we know that it is a scalar quantities. The, the vector form of this is displacement, right? So these are the, the a few quantities which we'll be talking about. Another thing which I want to emphasize here, in, and this will begin to, uh, to be uh, in heavy use from now on. If you are talking about the vectors and you are writing them in the terms of the vectors, Either you are writing date representing by a letter, which is bold face, okay? Or you are putting an arrow on top of the letter or below the letter, but there has to be an arrow associated with that, uh, that um, symbol. And then from that, we also recognize this is a vector. So these are the two popular ways of writing, okay? Here in this diagram, uh, you are seeing two things. There are vectors, which we are seeing that the vector A, which is from beginning from point A, ending at point B. We're also seeing from A prime to B prime, and then from A double prime to B double prime. These are three different vectors that we are talking about. But how can I recognize that these three vectors are the same vectors or they are different vectors? So what will distinguish uh, are the thing that we are going to compare with against one vector to, um, against another vector, okay? So there are two things to notice. When we are sketching a vector, it's not a straight line. You see it is a straight line with an arrow, okay? It's like the, the tip of the arrow. So this is called an arrow. The length from point A to point B when we are sketching them, that is the length that tells us the magnitude of the, the the vector quantity and the tip in whichever direction the tip is pointing that is the length tell us that the vector supposedly is in this direction this is the direction of the vector 
So if it was towards positive x, negative x, or y, or z, then you you uh, be it should be understood that the, the vector quantity is pointing in that particular direction. So two things to note about that. Other is that vector a a to b, a prime to b prime, a double prime to b double prime. These three vectors. If you compare these three vectors, you will find then the length of the arrows for all three vectors are the same. And you will also know when you are seeing them that these three vectors are pointing in the same direction. If that was a situation and they are representing the same quantity, then we will be saying these three vectors are essentially the same vectors. OK. So. There is another thing is point A to point B, like when we are comparing the two points and we are saying that all three paths, like here is a one is straight line, another one is this line, and another one is this a kind of a little bit lengthy uh, path. All three paths, all paths connecting the two points correspond to the same displacement vector, right? Because no matter how we reach from point A to point B, but displacement, always has to be the shortest distance between the two points, which is exactly this straight line from A to B. So. It might happen that while you are traveling from point A to point B, you have taken this path. Sometime you took this longer path in any of the paths you token uh, taken. Whenever you are taking the displacement, it tells you the shortest distance. So what we can infer from this information? The information is the displacement does not necessarily tell us the actual path which we ha which has uh, been taken from point A to point B. It just tell us the overall sense of the path means no matter how wiggly path you has taken, but at the end your purpose was to move from point A to point B and I should be looking at the shortest distance between these two points, not any trouble you have taken or encounter along the wiggly paths. OK. Now. Here when when there are vectors, we come towards the aiding vectors or we are we want to play a little bit the vector in order to get the sense of this. Like if there is a velocity, your your car was going with the 50 kilometer per hour towards north and then afterward you are either going 50 kilometers towards south. Well, OK. How can I make sense of these two velocities? One was towards north, another one was towards south. Magnitude of the two are the same. OK, how, how would I be able to determine any displacement curve during that time? So when such situation arises, we are looking for ways to add or subtract vectors. So whenever you are adding vectors, let's say vector A and B, these are two vectors and you are adding them. So they, it will give us a third vector which we are calling it resultant vector. So here you are seeing the resultant vector is S. OK. Now, what should be the graphical method of representing it? This is another thing to look, look for. And I'm showing you the graphical method now. So let's say that this is my vector A, which I have sketched from its tail to tip and note this. In this arrow, this side should be called tail. This this side should be called head. OK, so this is our vector A, which begins from the tail and ending at its tip. Now this is vector A. How can I aid vector B to vector A? Can someone know? Any of the, your students are familiar with the vector quantities? Can can you tell me how we can add that graphically? Uh, the tail of B to the head yeah, of A. Exactly. So the tail of the B vector should be placed at the tip of the first vector. So this will be the way of writing. Like this is my second vector which I'm adding. I should be putting the tail of the B vector at the tip of the vector A and then extending the vector in its per, uh, in its um, original direction. So this is the two vectors now. Now, though the guy has taken this path and then this path. But what is the overall sense? The overall sense is that he actually moved from the tail of the first vector to the tip of the last vector. 
So when I'm looking for the resultant vector, S vector, it should begin. Notice this. When you are representing the resultant vector, the resultant vector should always begin from the tail of the first vector and should end at the tip of the last vector. So it should be understood in this way. And the way in which you are seeing this diagram on this, this um, slide now, this method is called head to tail rule. Head to tail rule, okay? Because you are putting the head and the, the tail of the vectors when you are adding them. Do you have any question here on this slide? Okay. So whenever we are talking about the vectors, it should obey some laws. If they do not qualify with those laws, we are we cannot um, categorize that as a vector. Okay. Anything should be a vector when it obey these two laws. Okay. Like for example, there are lots of things when you are saying that this should be the water. Then when like you are de describing the characteristics of the water. If the water is, it should be flowing. It should have this kind of viscosity. It should have this kind of color and it should have this kind of taste. If it all these things are there, then we will be calling it water. So similarly, when you are describing anything as a vector, then it should obey two laws. One is called commutative law and another one is called associative law. These two laws should be there. If a vector does not obey them, then we cannot uh, say that this is a vector. And you will see later on at the end of the chapters and your course, then how we can knock some of the quantities out from the vector classification. So here you have two vectors, vector A and vector B. And this, uh, what this commutative law is telling us, if you started with vector A first, and then you added the vector B later to it, the result what you get, the resultant vector, which was the vector S on the last slide, slide, it is going to be the same if you had started with vector B first, then you added vector A to it later, it, you, it will give you the same uh, quantity and how it is. Let's see this diagram. I'm doing the last, the, the left side of this equation. This is my vector A, I started with, I sketched this vector, and this is my vector B. I started with this and I'm sketching this vector as well. Well, this vector A and vector B, I applied the head to tail rule. Now I am looking for the, the resultant vector of them. And this is the resultant vector, which I'm calling it A plus B, or vector S, which was there in the last slide. Okay. Now I'm beginning other way around. I want to begin with vector B first and then we add vector A to it later. So this is vector B. I started from the original point of the, let's say this was the origin. So I, I sketched the vector B first and then I add it to it vector A, okay? So you see that this is the order of these two are different. The other of the, the, the two vectors are different, and you are already seeing this, that it is called vector B plus A, which is the resultant vector. Now, if your aim was to go from this origin point A to this point B, then you see that it doesn't matter. Either you take vector A path first and then vector B path later, or you went with the vector B first and then later on vector A first, uh, later but it is going to give you to the same point from the point A to point B, and that's what we want. This is called commutative law. Any question on this line? Uh, doctor. Uh, yeah. When I add uh, uh, the A and uh, the B, it should be the values uh, greater than A plus B? No. That's what it is. Vector A and vector B, we added them what we get, it's a vector A plus vector B. Here, one thing is confusing for the students, and that's what you are actually pointing out to. Uh, these are not scalar quantities, right? 
it has a direction. And that's why, like you might, your mind might be perceiving this information that if I air vector A in this way and vector B is just straight to it, then the total length of the vector A and vector B is going to be very much large. Yes, that will be the case when the two vectors are parallel to each other. But if there is an angle, like this is one vector and this is a second vector, there is an angle to it, then the, because of that, the total length of this vector n vector b are going to be smaller versus if vector n vector b were parallel. Did you get this point? Yes, I got it. Thank you. OK. So now uh, there is another uh, property of that, just uh, proceeding with the same concept like as we did in the last slide. This is called associative law. And why it, there is association? Let's say you have three vectors and you happen to begin with the, any of the two vectors. If you begin with any of the two vectors, do you have that kind of freedom that at the end you will not be messed up and your information, whatever you wanted to collect, it will be the same. Means that the net displacement from point A to point B are going to be exactly the same. Yes, that's true. It doesn't matter in which order you started to add vectors. And let's begin with this. Let's say you, you had information about three vectors, vector A, B, and C. And then you happen to start with vector A and B to add them first. Whatever the resultant vector of these two vectors you got, you added that to the third vector, which was vector C. The overall sense, the overall um, results, what you get out of these three vectors, it should be the same if another student had started with the uh, B and C, the, he added them first, and later on he added that to vector A. The end answer in both cases are going to be the same. And here you see in this diagram, which is the graphical representation of this. This is vector A, this is your vector B. When you added them together, this was from A to B, it is the A plus B. Then vector C is already here, so you added the vector C to it. Right, so A plus B plus C, when you adding from the point A to point C, which is here, then you will be saying A plus B plus C, which is the shortest vector here. OK, now another student said, no, I want to begin with the B and, P, uh, B and C plus. So he started from this point here. This is his point, vector B, vector C. So the B and P, C, he added them together. So this is the net vector of that. And then later on, he added vector A to it. So if you look at this vector and this vector, this is exactly the head to tail rule. If I begin with that, the tail, the tail of the B plus C is here and the head is here. So when I'm sketching the resultant vector, it should be from the original initial point to the final point. And again, I'm getting A plus B plus C. So here I want to generalize now. Here, the, the example we, get, we provided, it's only for three vectors, but it does not matter whether you have three vectors, two vectors, or infinite number of vectors. Whenever you are adding them together, the order does not matter. In whichever order you started, it is the proper way. At the end, you will get the right answer. Now, here, whenever we are talking about the positive quantities, we also talk about the negative quantities. Like on a number line, you know that when we are talking about something, that the guy, from he moved from point A to point B, which was 10 meters to the right side. And we usually take that positive. So that distance he has covered in plus X direction. So we say plus 10 meter he has covered in the right direction. We also uh, perceive this information another way. If another student has started and he moved to the left side uh, from the origin to the left side by 10 meters. So we are saying he moved minus 10 meter from the origin. Or we can say he moved 10 meters to the left from the origin. So both these are we are commonly using. So for any positive quantity, we also have a negative quantity. So when we are talking about the vectors, how the negative quantity should be there, and how can we actually understand this? So the slide is displayed. Vector minus B 
is a vector with the same magnitude as B, but just opposite in direction. So you see that if, if this was my vector B initially from point A to point B, it was pointing. So this is point, uh, vector B. Negative vector B is going to be just replacing this arrow to the other side, which will be exactly 180 degree with respect to the first, first vector, okay? So you know that if I started from point A and I had reached to point B, okay? If I did it in that way, like I started from point A and I had reached to point B, and then I started from point B and reached back to point A. If I ask you guys, how much displacement have you covered? What should be your answer? Zero. 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 Because he, the guy initially and finally is at the same point. So this is what it tells us. That if you move in the positive direction from point A to point B and then move in the backward direction from the B to A, so the total dis, uh, the displacement for your entire uh, trip is going to be zero. So that representation generally can be done like a B minus B equal to zero, which is just we are using in the normal uh, numbers. But you can also have, uh, say that in the terms of the addition, if I want to use the words addition, then I say B plus minus B. And then you know this minus times plus is going to give me negative and then I'm getting zero. OK. So. Let's generalize this. If it was for the same vector, we do that way. If it was for any two different vectors, like you move from point A to point B, and that was you had covered 10 meter distance. While you are coming back from point B to point A, you had covered five distance. So now you travel in the opposite direction, but the distance which you have covered is not the same. So when you are looking at the net displacement, it's going to be to be five from point uh, A to the uh, point wherever you had ended. So difference between two vectors, which is which are vector A and B in this case again, uh, can be determined by using the same formula A minus B. R, as I mentioned, that the negative can be uh, covered up with the plus sign here and moving the negative inside the bracket. So whichever way you feel more comfortable with you can you can use that method but these are this is the way of uh, adding the vectors or subtracting the vectors or nullifying the vectors this is also called nullifying it okay so when you are getting the overall sense of the total trip of the vectors zero that's called nullifying okay so let's this is giving us to uh, to the checkpoint the magnitude of displacements A and B are three and four. The magnitudes of displacements A and B are three and four respectively. And C is equal to A plus B, okay? Considering various orientation of A and B, what is the maximum possible magnitude for C? So I think a student which he asked the question, uh, in the earlier slide, this checkpoint will clarify his mind here. OK. In which orientation should I add the vectors in order to get the maximum distance? Uh, when we go to the same direction. When they go in the same direction, OK? So here, the max, the sum is maximum when the two vectors are parallel. And that, that is going to be 3 plus 4 is going to give me the magnitude seven and this is this is exactly what we mean if these two vectors are straight they are connected head to tail so from the point a to point b the maximum distance we will get now in the second case they are saying what will be the minimum possible magnitude for that so quite rightly they are going to be in opposite direction to each other okay minus one yeah negative so a minus b right when we do this, A minus B, then they are going to give us the negative uh, displacement. OK, so this is this is uh, the vector A. Vector B is completely negative to it. 
And you know that if a guy has started from point A here and he ended up point B here, then you know that it is one meter, the overall net effect of his motion. While in this case, if a guy has started from this point and he ended up this point, so he has covered seven meter in that direction. Okay. Dr. So with this, Dr. yes. With the uh, point A, no matter the direction. For point A, uh, you can you can do this uh, in, uh, in other way around. Like uh, since they are asking for the magnitude, okay. So this negative, like the way in which I have sketched these vectors, this supposedly is going to be minus one, but they are asking for the magnitude. The magnitude always means positive quantity, right? Like when you are writing in the mathematics, if this is my minus one and I took the modulus of them or the magnitude of them, what quantity I get? One. One. And the negative sign is absorbed. So when we are talking about the magnitude, the negative positive Point, uh, the sign is not our concern. Uh, so you can really orient this in any direction you want. Uh, teacher? Yeah. Uh, can I write it as A minus and then B, uh, B positive? Yeah, yeah, that's what I say. You can do that and the answer what you will get, it will be plus one, right? Yes. Uh, so it in the end when since they're asking for magnitude so when you take the modulus of the plus it also give you plus quantity if you take the modulus of the minus it also give you positive quantity okay oh, thank you so much yeah. with this i'm going into uh, trigonometric functions uh, how many of you are familiar with this can you tell me that you know sine cosine and tangent yes yes we yes. know yeah yes. Yes. OK, so I will I will introduce it to, uh, them a little quick and then from then on we will be start using them. So. Look at this this uh, triangle here. You might be seeing this triangle, which is the right angle triangle. Right angle triangle means that this one of the uh, angle of the triangle is 90. So this corner is 90 degree. Now. Here what you see that. Uh, we are just naming different differently a little bit for the purpose of describing the these trigonometric functions. But you know that the name of this uh, side of the triangle is hypotenuse. This is perpendicular and this side is called base. But what we will be saying that with respect to this angle, like this is my angle which we have described here, this theta, and with respect to this, when we are talking about the adjacent theta, it would mean that we are talking about the side which is close to this um, this angle. OK, so this is called, called to be the leg adjacent to theta. And you know that this is the angle and this is the opposite side of that. So leg opposite theta. So there is uh, another side. So leg, leg opposite to theta. Now, these are uh, two, uh, two different uh, signs. And the the, uh, the top part, which is this side, it's again hypotenuse. We are keeping that uh, as it is. And I think it is very uh, very important here uh, to to use this kind of language rather than using the base and perpendicular, because the base and perpendicular students sometimes they mix up the information later on when they consider the base just to be this side only, uh, while you are con uh, concerned about determining the theta for this side. Uh, and they, they, they cannot perceive that this could be uh, also the perpendicular with respect to this angle. OK, so. Sine sine theta when we are talking about sine theta, it is the leg opposite to theta divided by hypotenuse like this side divided by this side. So when we take the ratio of these two sides, we are calling this ratio a sine theta. Uh, similarly, cosine theta. When you divide the length of this side and divide by the length of the hypotenuse, this is giving us uh, cosine theta. And the tangent theta, you can uh, approach to it from here. It is the leg, uh, leg opposite side, this side divided by this side. So when you do the, this to divide these two sides, then that's what you will get. It is tangent theta. But later on, you will also see that the tangent theta uh, can also be uh, put as a sine theta divided by cosine theta 
And once you do that, then you will see that the hypotenuse hypotenuse cancels out and you will get from here. So the sine divided by cosine, that's what you get for the, for the tangent theory. One more thing is, uh, probably when you are using your calculator, uh, you can encounter this problem often time that your calculator can either be in degrees mode or in radians mode. And then you need to work on that in order to switch from the degrees mode to radians or vice versa, whichever uh, quantity you need. So for this conversion, this is the formula for that. Angles may be measured in degrees or in radians. To relate those uh, two major uh, quantities, we say that whenever you go in a circle, right? If this was a circle and you started in a complete one, complete circle, then the degrees you have covered, you covered, uh, let's say this is my X axis. So from here, if I started to go in this uh, full path and I reach to this point um, from where I have started, the total distance I will cover, the total degrees I will cover, it is going to be called six, 360 degrees. But we also know that this is also called two pi radians. Based on that information, we can say that the two pi radians, two pi is equal to 360 degrees, okay? So that's what we uh, actually, we can begin. This is our the conversion factor for this. So here, if you want to convert 40 degrees uh, to uh, radians, then you know that when you are converting degrees, for sure it should be divided in degrees in order to cancel units, right? So 40 divided by 360 degrees, multiplied by two pi radians, it's give us 0.7 radians. Okay, with this, um, we want to know a little bit more about the vectors, and this is this is the this is the characteristic, the components of a vector. This is a characteristic which is associated with the vectors only. Okay, we do not do this for the scalar quantities, but for the vector quantities, we do this. So here I'm uh, sketching this on the whiteboard. So I have a vector a, and you know this vector. It, it uh, is uh, making an angle with respect to x-axis, x-axis, right? So when I'm looking for the uh, for the components of that, you can, I want to make the total vectors like two, two components here because it's a two dimensional quantity here uh, because I'm drawing this in the x, co x coordinate and y coordinate. So in the two coordinate system, I can represent only two quantities. And therefore, I want to keep only two components of this. The second thing is I want to represent them in such a way that it makes a right angle triangle for me. Just because in the previous slide, I shown you that we are dealing with the right angle triangle a little better because we have these quantities for it, uh, the trigonometric quantities. So here, uh, sorry, trigonometric functions. So this is vector A, and when I, I will be able to cover the same amount of distance is vector A has covered from origin A from to point uh, from origin O to point A. If I go along x axis this much, okay, which will be a distance along x axis, and I'm calling it AX. And then I started to move upward towards uh, towards the the point in the y direction, and I reach to this point by covering another distance, and I'm naming this AY. So if I cover AX and AY, it gives me a right angle triangle here, but also it covers the same amount of distance, okay? So whenever I get into this situation, I will be saying that the A and B are two components of vector A. Okay, here, uh, just tell me the, the sine theta definition. Can someone tell me the sine theta definition here? What should I be putting here for the sine theta? Uh, a y a y over a. Over a. a, y y over a. a. OK, so then what we do, we multiply both sides with a here and a here. So the a, a will be canceled out. And what I'm getting is that a y equal to a sine theta. OK, so that's what I got. Similarly, I get the, the cosine theta, so which is shown on the, the screen here. 
So this quantity, which we have described, and similarly, if you go with the cosine theta definition, like which is shown on this slide, you will get the AX equal to A cosine theta. Okay, now let's talk another thing. When you are uh, doing the high school mathematics and you have the, uh, the a triangle, you know the base and perpendicular for that, and you want to determine the hypotenuse. Which formula do you use? Uh, Pythagoras. Pythagoras. Pythagoras, right? So this is one side of the triangle. This is another side of base and perpend uh, perpendicular, and this is hypotenuse. So when I want to determine that, I will be looking at AX square plus AY square oh. under square root is equal to me A, right? So this is the Pythagoras theorem I applied, and I'm getting this uh, magnitude of vector A. Who is so who is so tired in this class now? Me. Okay. So this is the Pythagoras theorem that what we apply. Now for the tangent theta, which is the last quantity here on this slide, is just come from the same definition. The leg opposite to theta divided by the leg up adjacent to theta. So if this is the theta, the leg opposite to theta is Ay, and leg adjacent to the uh, to the theta is Ax. So this is the, what we get from there. Okay, don't be confused about this quantity. So here we have this checkpoint. Uh, in this figure, there are six figures given to us, and the question is, which of the indicated methods of the combining a, X and Y component of vector A are proper to determine the vectors? OK, so here you guys need to know. That whenever we are describing the vectors. I, I said that vector A and vector B are going to be the components of the vector, and this is the resultant of the vector. When I said it, you also see this that when I was sketching vector A, use AX, you see that I started it's from, it from the origin towards this, and I put the tip for this in the positive X direction. And similarly, when I was going uh, to sketch the AY, I sketched it in such a way that the vector goes to the top and the tip of this is towards positive direction. So I applied potentially head to tail rule. This was vector A, this is vector B, so head to tail rule I applied here. But when I'm sketching the resultant vector, as I had mentioned that it should begin from the base of the initial points and it should go to the final, final quantity, right? So you see the tip here is ending there. Based on this information, what, which figure do you see is appropriate and are representing the components? C. C. Uh, C. Okay. C, C is C correct. And what else? And F. D F as well. C and F is fine, yes. And, and some D, D F. Right? C, D, and F. Yeah, C, D, and F. These are the correct way of representing the, uh, the components. And here it's again uh, like A plus B and B plus A, okay? It's it's the same commutative law you can apply here. Like the way in which I described, I sketched vector A X first, A A Y later. But if I started with the A Y first, like move in this direction first by the amount of A Y, and then you move from here to here in the direction of A X afterward. This is going to give us the same quantity, which is the resultant vector A. Okay. Let's do this problem here. A small airplane leaves an airport on an overcast day and later sighted 215 kilometers away in a direction making an angle of 22 degree east of due north. How far east and north is the airplane from the airport when sighted? So here is the the language they are trying to um, to use and they want you to be introduced into this. Whenever 
you see this angle here. Angle 22 degree east due north. OK, that means that. Whenever you are trying to sketch a vector and you know that this is the X Y diagram, you can put it. The top is going to be north. This is going to be the east, right? This is going to be the west and this is going to be the south. That's what you put on the maps. OK, so when they say angle of 22 degrees east do north means that this is your north. So the vector you are sketching, it is going to be, to be towards east by 22 degree. So when you are putting this vector, it should make 22 degree with respect to north. That's what they mean. OK, so how far east and north is the airplane from the airport? When sighted. So basically, what we need to work for is to determine AX here, which is the AX, and here also we need to determine AY because this is the east and AY represent the, the distance towards north. Okay, and we know this angle here, that this is the angle which you want to use, but we don't know how much it is. So you guys know that what is the distance between X and Y quantity? Uh, the, the axis. Uh, 90. 90. 90 degrees. So 90 degrees is the, is the total angle from X to Y, and they are saying this vector is making 22 with respect to the Y axis. So you can easily determine this angle by subtracting 22 from 90. So it will give us, yeah, this one will give us uh, 68 degree. Then later on, since I'm proceeding with the AX quad, um, quantity, like the same way as I proceed here uh, earlier, so you know that the AX is going to be A cosine theta, and AY is going to be A sine theta. So I know that they are saying 215 kilometer away, it means that that is all, already the magnitude of the hypotenuse, which is the A. So I will use that and then <clears throat> put the angle of 68, which we just worked on, determine the dx. Similarly, using the sine theta, we can determine the y component for that, right? Like this. So this is the x quant a component. The overall effect is. Yes. You guys have any question? I can take one quick question here. Uh, teacher, you have a question. Yeah. I mean, I, I got the same answer, but I, I'm not sure about it. The angle, uh, there's uh -huh. something, the angle is on top, right? Yes. Yeah. So wouldn't the adjacent be the y axis? Uh, here, uh, probably you missed one step because when we were trying to bring this towards x and y, let me uh, just watch the video on the here. I'm working on the. Oh, no, sorry, 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 sorry. Oh. Uh, you, you used the other angle, never mind. OK, yeah, yeah, there is the what you are describing and it will be true when I'm uh, when I'm using the angle 22, OK? Yeah, that's correct. But Use if I'm 68. using angle 68, then yes, the other way I okay. should be. Using. My bad. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, Doctor. Yeah. Uh, after we found uh, AX, can we use uh, Pythagoras and find AY? Uh, yes, if you want to, because you already know the magnitude of A. This is not a vector quantity, it's magnitude here. And you already know the, um, uh, sorry, you, you know the magnitude of A and you also know the magnitude of X. So if you use the Pythagoras theorem, yes, you will be able to determine the DY, yes. But that is uh, that appears to be a little bit lengthier than just putting right away everything here. But in principle, they you can do that. Yes. Oh, uh, teacher. Yeah. Now in DY, why we didn't use uh, 22 instead of uh, 68? Okay. That's appeared to be a problem here. So let's watch, watch this whiteboard here, the way in which I'm doing. There is no problem if you want to use 22. So this is 215, which is, uh, let, I'm calling it A, 
and you know this angle is 22. So if you are so interested in using the, the 22 degree, yes, we can do so because this is a vector and we said that it doesn't matter if I go with A plus B or B plus A. So I start from here to here. This is my Y component and this is my X component, okay? Guys, uh, uh, we can continue here, uh, uh, but let me take the attendance for the students who wants to leave. Let me activate this attendance. Mr. Who did it? Uh, should he do it again? No, no. Th there was one student who had the problem. Yes, do it now. Do what you see with us. Like there is this attendance, just go ahead and click the attendance button because the class time is over. And I will continue with other students who have question. I will be responding to that. Yes, if I attended the first uh, link, do I have to do it again? No, if you have done it once, then you don't need it okay, now. Thank you. See you yeah. next week. Yeah, see. Yes, and David, so. Okay, so it seems that all students have responded, so I don't need you. And uh, you guys... Uh, me, Dr. Khan. Uh-huh. Uh, wouldn't it be easier for you if you use the attendance from Microsoft Teams? 